the main thing about that book was that it was in me. I did not have to find it. It was there and it was demanding to be written. The characters were in my mind very clearly from the beginning. And that never happens. I'm always struggling. I'm always fumbling. It takes me a while to get to know who they are and what do they want and what's the goal, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, it was all very clear to me. I saw this, uh, the, the main thing I saw in the beginning was this child who had had this horrible, horrible childhood, uh, badly traumatized, that turned him into this person who's sort of monstrous. And I thought, how do you, what do you do for this person or what, what's needed here? for some kind of a balance. And the the heroine was there instantly. It was like, okay, she's someone who just gets it. She gets the thinking. She gets the guy thinking. She gets whatever it is. And how is why is she that way? Because she grew up with boys all the time and she's just smart and paying attention. So I needed someone who could see through him. And it she uh Jessica just came to my mind as you know, so so they really formed in themselves on the stage and the rest of it, the the rest of that book, I know it sounds mystical and it's like writers shouldn't wait for this to happen because it doesn't usually. But it just wrote itself. It was like a movie and all I had to do was write it. That was the voice of Loretta Chase, author of Regency Romances single title, historical romances, and as everyone knows, Lord of Scoundrels. This is Fate of Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor. You're about to hear our Trailblazer episode with Loretta, where she talks about her, how she came to writing romance, um, her research process, and why she believes in historical research and folding it so well into her books and um, her life and romance and how it is that Lord of Scoundrels came to be. Without further ado, let's get into it. I am here we are with Loretta Chase. <laughs> I don't I'm just going to make words now. Just they're going to flow out of me like in a rush because I'm so overwhelmed. Loretta, <laughs> we are so thrilled to have you um oh thank you for having me it's an it's a delight uh i don't know that you know this but uh we are avowed uh loretta chase fans here at the podcast we reference your characters all the time oh thank Um, you and of course we've talked a lot about lord of scoundrels so i'm sure we'll get into that as well but um in general i'm just so thrilled to have you here uh thank you i'm i feel honored to be here because I know about your podcast, and I think it's just very cool. Thank you. So we start all of these conversations the same way, and that is to say, how did you come to this genre? I came um, in a very weird way because I was never a romance writer, a romance reader. Um, uh, my mind was poisoned by my English professors, <laughs> so I thought very scornfully of romance. Um, And the way I came to it was after I had been writing professionally. And, um, you know, my husband said to me, do you want to write video scripts for the rest of your life? What do you really want to do? And eventually, after much weeping, I admitted that I wanted to write a novel, but I had never been able to. I would write and write and write, and it just went on forever, and it didn't have a story, and it didn't make any sense. And I realized, I, it, just in that conversation, I made the connection with what I was doing in video and what could be done in a novel. And I realized all I needed was structure. Mm. So when you're writing scripts for video, you have a specific structure. You have a message that you want to get across. And I would always ask the clients, what's the message? Can you tell me in one sentence what you want the audience to come away with? And I realized that genre fiction does that. It sure does. Bless. 
Yes. <laughs> so I'm looking at mystery. I'm looking at science fiction. I'm looking at various genres. And I realized, but it was like, oh, wait a minute. Love stories. That's the part of the books that I really like. And <laughs> maybe that's where I should be working. And yeah, love conquers all. Yes, please. Because it doesn't in so many of the classic novels. Um The women are victimized. Um, They die if they have sex. Um, And so I thought, oh, well, this is a a great way to correct that. And and I have a structure. I have a structure. I have something I like, which is a love story. And that gave me my start. And it worked nicely. When you talk about the books that or the parts of the books that you always love, the love story. What were you reading before romance or before you came to the genre? Well, a good, a good example would be like Charles Dickens, Bleak Mm. House. All right. So there's Lady Deadlock and she's had an illegitimate child and there's like no forgiveness for her. Right. She has to, she has to die. Um, Anna Karenina, you know, she has an affair. She has to die. They, women who um, follow their sexual inclinations or fall in love outside of the norms of the time, they're punished. Um, and I wanted to rewrite those stories. So I actually, I did that with one of mine, um, Not Quite a Lady. I took Lady Deadlock's story and as a starting point and said, okay, here's a person who had a child out of the wedlock. It was kept a big secret but her, she's going to have a happy ending. So at some point, did you kind of read romance as like research or did you oh, just yes. like, okay. So, I mean, it, once you decided, wait, I might want to write this, did that happen concurrently or did you stop and think, okay, I'm going to give myself permission to read these books now? It was, um, I, I approached it the way I would have approached a, a project in an English class. I started doing the research. Mm-hmm. Do so the reading, I, Loretta. Yes, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> So I read maybe hundreds of romances um, because I was also looking to find where would my, where would I fit? Um, So I, at that time, you know, there was like Kathleen Woodowitz and Joanna Lindsay and um, they wrote those big sprawling romances. And I didn't think that was me. And then I encountered the, the traditional regencies and I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is a time period I'm very interested in. Um, I love the witty banter. Um, and it was like sort of, it, there were smaller books. So I felt like I could handle that for, for my first thing. So that was how I, I ended up there. But it was, there was a lot of research before I actually started trying to write a book. Your first books are traditional regencies, and they're category regencies, right? Right. I wrote for um, Walker and Company. Now, wait, that's a name we haven't talked about at all. I know. I don't think we've ever talked about that. What is that? (laughs) Wow. It was when I was started writing, there were so many places that were publishing regencies. There were so many lines. I made a big list. And I went with Walker because they published hardcover and I thought that was cool. Uh, Mm. But I was not expecting to be accepted. I just, that was my thing. And they accepted the book. So this is Isabella? Yes, yes. And uh, and then I I later discovered it was primarily they were um, publishing for libraries. Ah. Uh, And and that worked out fine because my uh, agent ended up selling the paperback rights to Avon. And it was through Avon that I met my editor, uh, Ellen Edwards, and she was the person who got me to write historical romance, longer books. So you did a few. How many books did you do with Walker? Six. Okay. Walker was publishing the hardcovers and Avon was publishing the paperbacks? Mostly, except for one book. I think Fawcett published one book. The rest of them were Avon. And Ellen was always your editor at Avon. Yes, Yes. And now talk, so obviously Ellen Edwards is a name that we have talked about before and heard many people talk about. Can you give us a sense of what that experience, what that editorial relationship was like with Ellen? Because it does feel like she had 
a really special eye. Oh my gosh. She was amazing. I just, I loved her so much. She would write like a little note, <laughs> like three words in the margins and a whole idea would open up for me. And I, or I would see how I had gone astray, but she wouldn't say you've gone astray. She would just ask a little question. Yeah. Um, and she was so perceptive. Um, she was, when she invited me to write um, historical romance, I said, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can write those big books. And, and she said, it's just like what you're doing, only bigger. And then she said, read Laura Kinsale. Oh, um, sure. a perfect a perfect beginning for you. Yeah. Yes. So she knew that I would connect with what Laura Kinsale was writing and, and she was absolutely right. She, I, she was just so insightful. I, I, I can't say enough about her. I think she was a fabulous editor. So you're reading, so you move from Walker over to Avon for, for single titles. And that's about, that's the early nineties. Yes. Yeah. And out, that's sort of what we always clock here as the heyday of there was a really or maybe not the heyday, but there was a really remarkable sea change in historical right then in the early 90s. And it was led largely by it seems like Ellen there. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what was going on during that time period. Did it feel like readers were just you know, drawn to historicals. And now we look back and we say, okay, well, Ellen had, you know, she'd acquired you and, you know, you put out Lord of Scoundrels, which we'll get to. And then, um, you know, she acquired Beverly Jenkins, who was, you know, doing what Bev does over there. And uh, Lisa Kleypas's, you know, books from the early 90s really were changing the game. And was there something... Was there something in the water? <laughs> I'm not sure, but, you know, there was something else. I mean, Avon wasn't the only place. This is the interesting thing. A lot of the re the, the friends that I made early on were writing regencies for Signet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Signet started doing what they were calling super regencies. Mm -hmm. So it was like the traditional regency, but a bigger story, more sex. And that's a, a lot similar to what was going on at Avon. Um, although Avon's weren't quite so much in that uh, Regency, not precisely in that Regency mode. So there was definitely something going on in other places. It was Across just that, the board. Yes, yes. And that Regency sensibility, I think, was, I, for some reason, it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. I've been around for so long because I'm so ancient that I see, you know, these ebbs and flows of, of what people are reading and what they're not reading. So I really can't account for it. I, it's hard to account for what happens with tastes. Yeah. And I'm not that analytical to begin with. I just, I write what I write <laughs> and cross my fingers. <laughs> it's okay. If you had six books before it, oh my God, I've already spaced on Walker. the name of that. Walker. Walker. Yes. Does that mean Lord of Scoundrels was the first Avon book? I'm sort of looking no. at like fiction DB, but it- No, it was The Lion's Daughter, right? The Lion's Daughter, and then Captives of the Night. And then, okay, I and I've, I've always forgotten to tell this story about that transition. But right around the time, I think, when I- had written Captives of the Night. Jane Ann Krentz started writing as Amanda Quick. Yeah, yep. And I think she sort of triggered a sea change in the way we were approaching historical romances because she came with that contemporary romance sensibility mm -hmm. and she was writing romantic suspense. And when she turned to writing these kind of these historical sort of Regency Victorian set, they had that feel to them and they weren't quite the sprawling books that we were working on at that time. And, um, I'm, I'm sure that fed into my thinking when I was writing Lord of Scoundrels because it's quite a different book from Captives of the Night. And the lion's daughter. And I think that's part of it was that influence of, wow, this is another way to do this. 
and and they're things that you absorb by osmosis and it was only i mean actually really <laughs> the other day when I was thinking about that, that I remembered about Jane Ann Krantz and that Amanda Quick thing and how that seemed to have changed things. I vividly remember as a reader reading Amanda Quick and feeling like this was different. I could tell it was different, right? Yeah. And I just was so drawn to those books. And it's not that I didn't love, I I of course loved, loved it all, right? But I vividly remember really feeling like everything about those books was different and so it doesn't surprise me to know that like that was apparent to to the authors at the time as well new rules almost right for what could be done yes it felt like heroines especially were shifting at the time yes like amanda quick brought a very different kind of heroine to the regency yes absolutely um and it was more clearly feminist Mm mm-hmm and more clearly aware of differences in communication uh, between women and men and addressed some really interesting um, aspects of uh, male-female relationships that I did not feel as though we had or I was dealing with anyway in my earlier books necessarily. Um, and then I, I started reading some other things. One of the books that was very influential was You Just Don't Understand. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Sure. I don't I don't remember that. This was a it was like a pop culture kind of psychology see, book women about, and the, men in about women and men in conversation. And it was like the first time I was ever and this was when I was in college, like right. Like I was in college from 1991 to 1995. And it was like this take a, I remember about like like topping people like right like when you're talking and someone comes along and just talks over you which I feel like I'm kind of doing now sorry everybody and it was really like a and like a real take at like this is how people communicate differently based on how mm. essentially they were raised in their in their gender identity so that was that was very enlightening and then that also led to my having conversations with my husband about that about communication styles so i think that also influenced the way i dealt with the relationships in my stories this week's episode of faded mates is sponsored by desiree nicoli author of the haven cove duology called to the deep book one and the song of lorelei book two jen did you know that uh in many circles it is not in fact the month of may it's the month of mermaid Amazing. I feel better for knowing this. Listen, if you're out there and you're enjoying all the drawings of mermaids that are being posted on social media and all the talk about mermaids that's happening and you're just cannot wait for this new live action Disney movie, we have the series for you. Uh, This one is pretty delicious. And I use that word intentionally because it features Killian Quinn, the captain of an offshore fishing boat, that receives a, discre- a that receives a distress call from a sailing ship in a terrible storm early in the book um in the duology he and his crew head out they make a big save they save the crew and a woman who does not know who she is and has no knowledge of how she got on the boat uh turns out this is Lorelai Roth who is not just a normal woman she is actually a mermaid and in the world building of this series mermaids eat people <laughs> I, i'm not even mad about it listen at one point in the blurb it says the handsome captain begins to look like a tasty snack in more ways than one perfect no so, notes are they gonna get together what happens when he finds out she's a flesh-eating mermaid does she eat him and like not i mean i'm sure sure we all know Listen. what you're about to say. Here's the thing, everybody. <laughs> in, in celebration of Burr May, you can get both books in the Haven Cove duology between May 15th and May 22nd for only 99 cents wherever you buy your ebooks. It's also available in print. Thanks to Desiree for sponsoring this week's episode. And happy Burr May to all who celebrate. So Ellen brings you over to do these kind of single titles for his for Avon you write two and then you write Lord of Scoundrels and let's get into it 
Um, <laughs> I mean, because, right, we have to. Um, tell us about the writing of it you know, the conceit, the conception of it. And then because you say, well, they weren't like these big sprawling books from before, but Lord of Scoundrels is a epic story. I mean, it covers a lot of ground. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you, how it came to be. Okay. Um, I had to make myself some notes about this because (laughs) I I write, yeah, well, yes, long time ago. And I write intuitively. So I'm not quite sure what I'm doing most of the time. There were some things that fed into that. But the main thing about that book was that it was in me. I did not have to find it. It was there and it was demanding to be written. The characters were in my mind very clearly from the beginning. And that never happens. I'm always struggling. I'm always fumbling. It takes me a while to get to know who they are and what do they want and what's the goal, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, it was all very clear to me. I saw this, uh, the, the main thing I saw in the beginning was this child who had had this horrible, horrible childhood, uh, badly traumatized, that turned him into this person who's sort of monstrous. And I thought, how do you, what do you do for this person or what, what's needed here for some kind of a balance? And the, the heroine was there instantly. It was like, okay, she's someone who just gets it. She gets the thinking. She gets the guy thinking. She gets whatever it is. And how is she, why is she that way? Because she grew up with boys all the time and she's just smart and paying attention. So I needed someone who could see through him. And it, she, uh, Jessica just came to my mind as, you know, so, so they really formed in themselves on the stage and the rest of it, the, the rest of that book, I know it sounds mystical and it's like writers shouldn't wait for this to happen because it doesn't <laughs> usually, but it just wrote itself. It was like a movie and all I had to do was write it. And that's how it feels. I mean, it feels it is how it feels reading when you it read too. it. You just feel like it. It's just perfection. Thank you. It, it, but it, I, I consider it a gift. I got a gift from the writing gods. Um, with that book, you were talking about like Dane's like trauma, right? Right. So, what's interesting to me about that is, I think a lot of people kind of, I don't know, like write about trauma without like doing a lot of research on trauma and at one point i was talking we have a friend who is like an expert on trauma and she was like this book does it so perfectly and so i mean was that part also intuitive or was that something where you really did think like how can i write about his trauma i mean i i don't don't know like maybe it all was mystical but it's hard i think to write about traumatized characters without feeling like you're taking advantage of traumatized people. I don't know if that makes sense. It's an empathetic thing. And it's also, if you look back at your own own childhood and the way children treat one another, um, it that wasn't so hard for me. I knew quite a bit. I had done quite a bit of research. So I understood about the bullying at Eton. And um, it wasn't that hard to imagine a child who's been rejected by his family and has dealt with abandonment. I think it was just, I don't know, this is something that writers do. You put yourself, try to put yourself in the other person's shoes or you think back to your own childhood and maybe your friends, what happened to them or things you saw in the playground um, you're drawing on all of that. So it wasn't like, I, it wasn't as though I studied trauma. I was just imagining, trying to imagine what kind of torturous childhood would make a person just shut everything off. So obviously, this book struck a chord across romance. I mean, it is a book that 
was talked about then it is it continues to be talked about it is on every list every you know every it is a book that is held up by so many of us including us um as the best of it the best of the genre and i wonder if you could speak to the reception at the time and um it sounds like it was electric for you in the writing but what happened after <laughs> well that's so that's what's so funny it's like when I wrote it, I felt, and I said this to Ellen, I said, I think this is a pretty strong book. <laughs> sure. sure. That sounds exactly right. I mean, writers are always like, it's, uh, I think it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing right. about Ellen, oh, God, I loved her so much. She's, she used to write like 40-page notes on your books, which no one has time to do anymore. Whoa. But they were so wonderful. They were so wonderful. Well, she had like two little notes on this book. That was it. For Ellen, that was, that never happened. That never happened. So, so I felt like, okay, this book really holds together. So that was, that was great. But, you know, in terms of reception, um, it got, they sent it out for blurbs and I got really nice blurbs from various writers, but the book didn't like take off or anything. It was just, you know, it did okay. And then it did win an RWA Rita. But it took that book took like 12 years to earn out its advance. Oh, wow. wow. Really? Yes. And it just was the little engine that could or did something happen that I don't know. Um, <laughs> it started appearing on that all about romance list as a top book. And then I think that it might have just been really a lot of word of mouth started. So more and more people started reading the book and then it built up momentum. But initially it was like, it was no big deal. Right. It was just a very good book. Yeah. yeah. Just right. 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 I'm, I'm not surprised by it because I think one of the fascinating things about romance readers, and we've talked about this before, is there are books I love when I read them. But I never want to revisit them. And then there are books that I that like grow on me over time. Like I don't I don't. And I think that maybe there's something special about romance in that way mm -hmm. that. And so it, it doesn't necessarily surprise me because there are books that I, you know, when I first read them, I'm like, it was OK. And then I'm like, wait, why have I read that? Reread that book now seven times. Right. <laughs> so it, it's it it surprises me the way the way things have a hold like i don't know like a romance the keeper shelf is no joke right yeah. and i think that like the cumulative effect of it being on the keeper shelf for so many people right it, that word of mouth is really powerful i mean I, when i first started talking to people like openly about liking romance i would say to them um they would ask for recommendations and I'll be like, I have two for you. And one's historical, one's contemporary. And if you don't like either of them, then you don't like romance, which you guys, that seems dramatic, but that's what I would tell people. And it was <laughs> Lord of Scoundrels and Bet Me by Jenny Cruz. Oh, that book. Yes. Yes. But just me. like terrific. These books are, are what romance is all about. And if you don't like them, then you don't like romance and that's okay. More for me. <laughs> Yeah. But I also think there's something to Jessica. I mean, not to keep coming yes. back to the heroines, but I feel like Jessica Trent holds up, you know, however many years later. We don't need to count them, Loretta. But the <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like she has we just we we read this. We read Lord of Scoundrels for one of our deep dive episodes uh, a couple of years ago. And, you know, did a kind of big episode on it. And Jessica continue. if Jessica walked off the page of Lord of Scoundrels right now and walked into a modern historical written this year, she remains as relevant, as amazing, as aspirational as any heroine ever. Oh, and wow. I think that is a hallmark of a book that just will forever be one that we hold up. Um, but I'm always, fa I'm fascinated to hear that it, it took 12 <laughs> yeah. years to earn out. <laughs> I, I mean, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So you've written what is arguably, um, 
I mean, not here, arguably, but arguably the greatest romance of all time. But we still have to, it hasn't earned out. So (laughs) you still have to make a living. Um, And I want to talk a little bit here. I think this is a good place to talk about it because one of the things that we have um, loved or that I have loved about your books over the years forever is how much research goes into them, how how much love and care you give the worlds that you create. Um, you used to have a blog that I loved very much uh, called Two Nerdy History Girls, um, which you had with your friend whose name is now escaping me. Susan Holloway Scott. Yes. And in that blog, you used to tell these great stories about, you know, how how dark the ballrooms would actually be mm. in romance novels. Or, you know, one of... Uh, the legendary scene from Lord of Scoundrels is that is the glove scene with the button hook and that, you know, there, you know, there's so much discussion over the fan. Right. Or remember the, the dueling book with the bird pistols? Yes. Yeah. The bird oh, pistols. Yes. Right. Yes. Which I was like, wait, this is a real yeah. thing. This is fascinating. And then, you know, my other favorite, Mr. Impossible, the, all the Egypt stuff. Um, and I do want to know if that came from the mummy or not, because that is <laughs> that is a discussion yes. that comes. <gasps> no, it did. The mummy you heard it here. The, the, mummy, <laughs> the mummy absolutely inspired that book. Yes. Tara, you just made a lot of people really happy. Exactly. <laughs> we, like, this has been speculation for a long time, and now we have confirmation. Amazing. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, wait, I can do this. Um, and I always wanted to write about Egypt. I I have been so fascinated by that, particularly what happened in the early 19th century um, and the discoveries that were made then. But, I mean, there were these intrepid women who were involved um, in the in that discovery. So, yeah, I loved doing the research for that. I have way more books than I ever needed to write that book, something <laughs> like 50 books on Egypt. And, uh, no, having them in the library wasn't enough. I had to own them. So, yeah, we support you. Everyone just buy the books I want. It's so, fun. talk about the re- the research because I do think that that is one thing that often historical romance novelists get. People don't realize quite how much research goes into the books because it does feel so uh, invisible a lot of the time. Well, that's the goal. the goal is to make it invisible. I mean, you you read books and books and make tons and tons of notes and look at all these images and you're digging into historical newspapers and two lines appear on the page that have to do with that topic. Mm -hmm, But as Susan and I have often said, we really have to understand it. We have to be able to visualize it. We have to feel like we're there in order to make the reader feel as though she's there. So and I, I love it. I love reading the old newspapers. And it's, it's like it, this has been one of the fascinating and um, positive aspects of technology from the time when I first started writing, when we had no access to anything. And trying to find information on the Regency, we were so dependent on what Georgette Hare wrote and um, a limited selection of books and memoirs that were not very accurate and now we can get primary sources and i i just love that i love reading the newspaper and finding an event that happens say oh wait a minute i'm going to use that in a story it's like i did that in the the last book um 10 things i hate about the duke i read about this fancy fair that was so crowded with people and every people were fainting because it was crowded i said oh (laughs) i have to set a scene there (laughs) So tell us about the research process. Do you, um, as you, you said, you're an intuitive writer. Are you, um, are you researching as you go? Do you sort of have a sense of what you're going to tackle in the book? Uh, do you have a file? How does it work? Initially, what I was doing, I was taking, I think it was Stephen King's advice, and I was research, or maybe it was Lawrence Box, somebody. Um, I was researching what I needed to know for the scene. But now, and over the last maybe 20 years, I ha- I feel as though I, I need to get some sense of where I'm going to be with the story. Where What's the location? Um, and then I sort of build from there. 
um, and I kind of like that method better. I like being going through the newspapers and looking at what's happening, say, in May of 1832 and thinking about what can I do with that? Because there are just they're tons of ideas there for me. So now it's a little more of a little bit, some of the work in advance, but then most of the work as I'm writing. At some point, the Mr. Impossible, that series is not with Avon. That is with Berkeley. Right. Right. So what's ha- what happens at some to at, in that in that world? Like, how does that how does the shift happen? Well, what happened was I finished um, the last Hellion and um, I had writer's block. Uh, my father had died and I uh, I didn't realize that that was what was going on. Uh, you know, it was grief and I had very bad writer's block and I couldn't write. And I had to, I bought back my contract. And I did not think I was going to write another novel. Oh my and gosh. then, yeah. And then um, what I did, I went back to writing video scripts and that sort of thing for a few years. And then uh, things changed in our personal circumstances and it became necessary for me to actually get a real job. And um, I've got myself a new agent and, um, she put me in with uh, Berkeley. There had been an editor there who had been courting me all during my mental block period because I was still going to conferences. Um, Gail, oh, I can't remember her name. Anyway, she had been courting me. She said, whatever you write, just can I look at it? And so she ended up being the editor. I, so I was at Berkeley for a few years. But then she left Berkeley and I'm not, they, my agent wasn't really thrilled with how the books were being sold. And so well, when she, was that? That that had to have been like early 2000s. Yeah. This, th- it was early 2000s when I went to Berkeley. Um, and then I, let's see, I wrote, so I wrote Miss, Miss Wonderful, Mr. Impossible and Lord Perfect. Oh, and then I had breast cancer. Um, oh, that's a small other thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was finishing that book when I, I was finishing Lord Perfect when I had breast cancer and I had to take a little time off from writing. And then when by that time I was getting ready to go back to work, that was when my agent was saying, you know, I think we can do better at Avon. And um, Avon, you know, welcomed me back. And the last couple of books in that series were through Avon. So a lot of, you know, some of these things, it's like your personal life um, messes things up for you or makes them better or whatever, but that's what happened. I want to go back to this intuitive writing piece too, because it feels like from, you know, we've known each other for a while. Yes. um, And it feels like one of the magical things about your books is that you write them and you sort of write until you're done. And then the book, then the book comes out, right? It it feels like um, you really do honor the text and the story in a in a way that many of us, because of the way romance works, don't don't do. So I wonder if you, when you start, but when you sort of come to a new series or to a new book, are you waiting for inspiration to strike before you start? No. I start writing, uh, and this has to do with my mm-hmm. training in art, which my my art professor always said, if you wait for inspiration, right, so start, right. you might be waiting forever. Just start doing the work. So I start doing the work, and I find my way in the course of doing the work. So I have been able, sometimes I've been able to write a nice, uh, long uh, outline, and uh, that works beautifully, and that did work beautifully for me for a number of books. And other times, I just have to do it by the seat of my pants because that's the way the book wants to be written. So I have to do whatever. It's hard to say. It again, intuitive. It's I'm doing whatever is working at the time. And lately, it seems to be sit down, start writing, see where it goes, figure out the things as you go along, and then it's like go back and make it come together. So it's a 
construction process. It's not linear at all. And it's, and I don't think my mind really is linear. And I don't think even my earlier books were all that linear, but I was able to work out plots in advance um, in a way that made my life much easier. But I just can't do that lately. No, I mean, I wish I could. I'm the same way. But I can't. So <laughs> have to. Yeah. It, um, some, you know, you have a vague idea of what you want to do. It was like when I did the dressmaker series, for instance. Okay. I, I thought, all right, I'd like to have three sisters. Um, I have some idea of, of what they're trying to accomplish. I know what they want to do. They want to rule the world. And then it would be a matter of like figuring out, okay, who are they? What, what are the differences between them? Um, and then the the plots start coming together, but they arise very much out of the characters. So if I don't know, if I don't know the characters, I can't get a story. I was go- I would love to be able to write a plot and have the story go with it. <laughs> no. it never does that happen for anyone. Happens. I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, I think char- I, th- I think character is really king in romance. Like I I I think that's for me at least as a reader right i feel like when people start with a plot sometimes i'm like yeah but why are these characters here yeah (laughs) right like wait that yeah that's not enough i need to really believe that how they got there yeah they're not puppets this week's episode of faded mates is sponsored by avery maxwell author of your last first kiss Penny Mulligan is a mess. She has had a disastrous first marriage. She's basically the single mother to three perfect but rowdy boys and an ex-husband who is a a bunch of trouble. The only thing she has going for her is the perfect eye candy who shows up bringing coffee to her boss every Wednesday. Oh. Dylan Henry. He is just like perfect fantasy material. Handsome, charming, thoughtful, and she, but she's just like not in a place for this no she has three yes boys and an ex-husband nobody has time for new people so she is just like i'm gonna have fantasies about mr wednesday but then dylan freaking henry shows up at her doorstep and he's totally into her and he is ready to just like figure out a way to like take the perfect chaos of her life and turn it into hga oh i love it this is great for anybody who loves a small town romance, for uh, people who are interested in single moms as heroines, friends to lovers, second chance, found family. Um, if you want to read Your Last First Kiss, what a title. Um, you can find it in print or in ebook or with a monthly subscription to Kindle Unlimited. Thanks, as always, to Avery Maxwell for sponsoring the episode. We talk a lot. I think we, ex- you know, I know Sarah experiences at a deep level that romance readers connect with connect with the books in such a way that, you know, almost everyone we've had on talks about letters they've received from readers or, right? So what do readers tell you about how, about your books? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Particularly during COVID. But before, I have had so many messages from people telling me the books helped them get through cancer. The books helped them get through grief. The books helped them get through COVID. Um, And I mean, uh, from the time I started writing romance, I really understood the value, but I think it's had much more of an impact in the last few years of what we do when we write romance, what we're doing for other people when we write romance is we're giving them a place to be where it's, where things are okay. You know, it's going to come out right in the end. And the more difficult the world around you is, the more important it is to have this place where you can go. Um, And, I'm all for escapism and I'm never going to hesitate to say that my books are escapist because they are, and I feel like they should be. So, um, yeah, I get, uh, yeah, I've had, I've had messages that just made me cry. 
And I think the last couple of years have been so hard on people um, that it makes, in my view, romance more important than ever. Yeah. Because we're giving them that safe place to be for the time of reading the book. So you had, you have, you know, people who have inspired you over the years and, um, you know, it's, it sounds like you've had a, a group of other writers who you've connected with and who love research as much as you. And, but I wonder if you could talk about who are the, who are the people who you have spent, who have really kept you going? Um, because I know that this isn't always an easy job, right? Yeah. Um, well, you know, Susan Holloway Scott and I have been friends for a million years now. And uh, we talk on the phone a lot. Uh, we go to Colonial Williamsburg. We meet up at Colonial Williamsburg almost every year. And, um, you know, she's really important part. She's just been, uh, well, a, a really good friend. Um, and we can talk about it. And that's part of the thing, too, because, like, it was one of the great things I discovered when I started writing romance and I started going to conferences. It's like, Oh, wow. I found my tribe. You, you can talk to, we're talking to other women mostly um, who are writers and we're living in that same environment and we're having the same struggles. And that's not something I'm going to be finding in my everyday life. I love my husband. I love my sisters and I can talk to them about stuff, but not the way you can talk to other writers. So Susan's important. Um, there have been a lot of people over the years. When I was first starting out, Mary Jo Putney was very, very encouraging to me. She reached out to me, sent me a letter, you know, uh, early, early in my career, like with my first or second book. Um, there was a little cabal of writers, signet regency writers, uh, with whom I was friends and we would get together at conferences. Um, and, uh, you know, and then over the years, I've met more people. It's like now I, you know, to chat with Caroline Linden. Um, so the, it, it's, it's evolving. Um, but yeah, the, the, that, that's one of the great things that the great discoveries for me, uh, when I started writing romance, I was like finding all these women, um, and they were feminists mm -hmm. like me and we had similar goals and, the same kinds of fights and the same kinds of people don't understand <laughs> what I'm doing. Do you feel like that's that sort of thing. shifting now? Or do you feel like we're still getting the same kind of response? Um, I've, I'll tell you, I miss the conferences. Yeah. Me too. I miss the one The it's like, yeah, Zoom is nice, but it's not like person to person sitting in like the bar or outside a, uh, a, a meeting place and uh, hanging out with your friends and talking or meeting new people that way. The, 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 the personal uh, direct conversations are something I miss very much. Um, and I, I, I mean, my, my local uh, writers group, it's like, they, they haven't been able to have a conference because, well, once COVID sort of simmered down and it was possible, it's like, well, we need vi volunteers and people don't have time and people are overworked. So that's something I miss. I miss that community, in other words. And and with this the, the crash and burn of RWA, that's, uh, that was, yeah, that was bad. And um, and romantic times for all the craziness. <laughs> that was a great way. It to really connect, was, wasn't it? <laughs> Jen yeah. never experienced it. It was a whole ride. <laughs> so I only I only did it once, but it was like it was such a trip. I was exhausted afterwards, but it was really wonderful, it's fun. So this is one of the hard questions, I think. Um, but what do you think is the mark that your books have left on the genre or are continuing to leave on the genre? <laughs> I don't know. 
Maybe. I don't know. So someone else would have to tell me what mark they're leaving. Cause yeah. I, have, I have. Well, maybe, maybe we can try it this way. When, what do you think is the hallmark of a Loretta Chase novel? Okay. When I first started writing, the one thing that was very, very clear in my mind was that uh, my heroines were going to be strong. Mm. They were not going to be victims. So there was that. Uh, The second thing was I was never going to write down to my readers. I was always going to assume everyone was smarter than I was. So that's informed what I've done. Um, And then the other thing is But the other thing has evolved, which is the research. And I feel as though it's possible for historical romance um, to get closer to that historical novel kind of approach to research and ground people in the world that you're writing about. And but that doesn't mean that it has to be. But that's what I need to do. So I think it's that those, the three things is the, the, the very strong heroine, the not talking down to people and, um, the, the world trying to create a, a historical world as close to accurate as I can, but still without violating the trust my readers have that I'm going to keep them in a safe, place where things are going to come out right so i might touch on some ugly aspects of history but i'm not going to force my readers to 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 live in that because their things are crappy enough around them for most people and that's not what they come to my books for so the escape i want i want them to have a lovely escape feel like they're time traveling and dig the heroin the most, you know. Do you think that um, we talk, a, I mean, you know, Sarah and I have both been readers. She's been writing now we don't have for to count them. however, 20 years, <laughs> whatever it is. Okay, sorry. We've been reading for a long time. I'm, I, one of our questions is sort of about like the ebb and flow of the genre, right? Like, so... Mm-hmm. How do you think you've seen romance change over time? Or do you have thoughts about where you see romance going in the future? Um, There has been ebb and flow for sure. Um, Starting out in a world where uh, traditional Regency romances were a big thing and there were dozens and dozens of lines and then they kind of lose their popularity. And then every few years we hear, historical romance is dead so i've heard that a bunch of times and in fact i'm hearing it lately <laughs> me too <laughs> um, <laughs> but it doesn't die yeah. right yeah it doesn't seem to die and the readers say they like going there they want to go there they want to be transported they want that time travel aspect they want to be taken farther away from current reality. And that's what historical romance does. I mean, contemporary romance also takes you away, but there's still that element of, you know, the real world's there and there's some real world things we have to deal with. Whereas, you know, my people are running, going around in their little carriages and uh, they don't know anything about cell phones and, uh, and YouTube or Facebook or TikTok or any of those things. So it's like... It feels like it's a an escape to a quieter time. And I think that I believe that will continue to be something that people like. People have always read historical books um, for hundreds of years. They don't always read books that are set in their own time period. So I think that's a continuing interest. Um, what's But I really am not sure what's going to happen. You know, things are in an uproar right now. There's a lot of upheaval in the publishing industry. So it's a little puzzling. Um, In terms of other changes that I have seen, well, there's definitely been one big change for the better, which is when I started out almost 
pretty much like 99% of the books were by white authors and they were about white people. Um, and now we have, uh, we have books that have different cultural slants and we have books that are dealing with different kinds of sexuality. Um, early in my career, one of my gay friends said to me, are there any gay romances? And I said, I don't know Mm -hmm. about any, but now that's, but now that's there. So I think those things are great that we have evolved to that point. Yeah. So, um, we always like to ask two questions to, to wrap up. And, and the first is, um, which of your books do you hear the most about? Which is the book that readers come to you the most to discuss? Um, and the second is, which is the book that you, as the writer, feel the most connection to? Whatever way that means. Well, obviously, the, obviously the one I hear yeah. the most about is Lurch Scoundrels. <laughs> that was That's an easy, just... that was a softball. <laughs> right right so like when i when i do some kind of a if we do an in-person thing and we have a bookstore there and they want to order books i always have to have lawyer scoundrels there because people want it so which is i mean that's that's a gift um that someone people still want to read my my book that i wrote a long time ago um it, particularly in a genre that seems to have such a short shelf life. And in terms of what books I uh, feel the best about or the strongest about or love the most or whatever. Okay. Incredibly proud of Lord of Scoundrels. How mm-hmm. can I not be? On the other hand, my favorite book is always the, be- the latest book, the one uh-huh. I most recently finished, because I like to feel that I'm getting better mm-hmm. as a writer. Um, so I felt very proud of the last two books. I especially felt very proud of 10 things I hate about the Duke. Um, and I hope I'm going to feel even better about this next book. If I ever get it <laughs> finished. Um, yeah. So my Would favorite you books care to talk about that one at all. I yeah. Mean, I'll, I'll, no I'm pressure. happy to talk about it. No, okay. no, it's good. Jen knows already. People she's, ask. Been she's asking, been around me long asking. enough. Loretta, I know. I'm like, she knows that these are sticky questions. I know. <laughs> exactly i would never have brought it up if you had not mentioned it first i just want to thank you i appreciate that but i it's i've had to i've done a couple of blog posts because i just get so many out when's the third book coming out is there a third book what happened to the blackwoods blah blah so i have this block again Mm. um and it started Let's just say yeah. there was a political situation going on in the world Gosh. Sure. that <laughs> just yeah. depressed the daylights out of me and made me crazy, and it was just so incomprehensible. So there was that, um, and and then in the middle of that comes COVID, right? Um, and you're thinking, oh wow, this is such a great opportunity. I'm all no. isolated. I can't go no. anywhere. Seems I'll wrong. I'll write a book nothing blank so i'm sitting in front of the computer every day dutifully because you don't wait for inspiration you start writing and i'm writing every single day and i'm writing complete garbage just Mm. boring crap day after day after day after day after day um so yeah that's what happens and you know i had to tell my publisher and my agent i'm sorry i can't deliver i the book's way over, it's like over a year overdue. Um, and I'm just now starting to make it get together, but it's still a struggle. Um, I feel like I'm emerging from the writer's block, but it's not coming the way it should be. So, you know, it's, it's been hard. This has been a really tough time. It's not any comfort to know I'm not the only one either. That's no comfort. I mean, one of the questions, this is a question we get so often, You, I mean, we writers, and I'm sure you've gotten it a million times, but this question of writer's block, you know, what what do you do? How do you come out from underneath it? And 
are you now because you sort of feel like maybe the shroud is being lifted um is is there is there some piece of advice that you have for those of us out here who are also feeling weighted down by the world um i had i i've done a couple of approaches so um the first time i had writer's block i just walked away and did something completely different which was writing video scripts um it wasn't all that satisfying but <laughs> boy it pays really well sure good <laughs> and but but this time um I just felt like I had to keep writing um, because then I felt like if I didn't keep writing, I would succumb to despair and I didn't want to go there. So I kept writing a couple of times. I, I said, okay, I'm going to just stop for two weeks and see if that refreshes my brain. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And we have traveled. So, um, you know, refresh the brain, but this time I've just kept at it. I just keep writing it in the hopes that things will start becoming clear. And it's actually working. The, the hero and the heroine have very gradually and reluctantly started letting me know <laughs> who they are and what they want. And so that's incredibly encouraging to me. And also... Um, it helps if you have someone to talk to that's a trusted professional. And I am very fortunate in my agent and editor. So I can talk to them about things and bounce ideas off them, show the material, and have them come back and make give me little bits mm -hmm. of inspiration here and there. I, I think we each have to find our own way out of this. I I know I've I've heard of people who say, well, I just walk away for a couple of days and it comes back. <laughs> days. Like, oh, I'm telling you that would happen. Is that writer's yeah. block or is that just like a writer's burp? I mean, exactly. That's a good good analogy. Yeah. So um, I think for me right now, what's been working is to just keep writing. Just keep writing because I'm a writer. Even if it's crap, it's something, and you never know what, what's going to come out of it. And that's happened a few times. It was like, I'm writing crap, I'm writing crap, I'm writing crap. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I can work with this. So that's been the approach. I would not wish this on anybody. It sucks. But there is going to be a book. Great. We're ready when like you are. <laughs> No, I, I told my agent, I said, I'm going to write this book. I have to write this book. I need to write this book. I want to write this book. It's going to get Good. written one way or another. I just want to say this was amazing because I tried to keep my cool the entire time. I just want everyone to appreciate that. Um, if you live in New England or feel like coming to New England, uh, Loretta is going to be at the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts on Saturday, May 20th, uh, 2023, <laughs> for the rom-con uh, <laughs> up there. The Ashland Public Library has a great romantic uh, romance novelist event, um, and it's outdoors, and it's a whole day long, and I'll be there too, and so will Megan Frampton and Caroline Linden, so historical writers, and Sandra Kitt will be there too. So... Um, who was also a trailblazer. Um, so you can join us there. We'll put ticket information in show notes for everyone. Um, but you can get your copies of all your favorite Loretta Chase books signed. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. I did it last fall and it was so I'm fabulous. looking forward to it too. So Sarah, you're going to have a great time. You're going to have a great time. I will hopefully not have COVID this year. That's I'm going to try but my don't best. Don't have that again. <laughs> <laughs> um Loretta this was amazing you are always amazing I love hearing you talk so no oh, it's wonderful talking to you both it really is you, you have just like such a great sensibility and uh sensitivity um about the genre and about the authors it's really a pleasure thank you listen <laughs> it was special it just came to her fully formed like Athena <laughs> Or like J.R. Ward. I'm also fascinated by the the 
dichotomy between the way Lord of Scoundrels came to her. And then I would, she didn't say it, but I would imagine that then struggling with writer's block would be all that more painful if you've had that kind of experience, right? Yeah, presumably. I mean, I'm really, I was really grateful to hear her talk about writer's block, actually. I mean, a lot of this, uh, for those of you listening, you probably got the sense that this was more about the writing, this conversation, than really I think any of them have been, um, which was obviously really wonderful for me, you know, and for probably every writer out there who's listening. But listening to somebody talk about how they struggle with writer's block is really interesting because, um, as I said, in the conversation, we get a lot of co- we get a lot of questions as writers about writer's block. And the instinct is always to just sort of wave it away and say, oh, I don't believe in writer's block. Writer's block isn't real. Just keep pushing. Like, it's not a fun job. You just it's it's not that you're blocked. It's just that, you know, you have to sit your ass in the chair. And so it was really good to hear her say, no, it is real. And for those of us who have gone through serious issues, serious like grief, um, you know, anxiety about the world it can be debilitating. Yeah. Well, and I was also really fascinated to hear that she's essentially grappled with it twice and that it presented in a different way both times. Because I think that's the other, what I feel like is sort of a, you know, like that writer's block is just like its own thing. It's a thing. And it's like, no, just like anything, it can manifest itself in lots of different ways. And so, you know, one time it was she just kind of put everything down and walked away from it and just did something totally different. And then this time, in, in you know, she's she really is taking the like, put your butt in the chair and kind of move through it. And I think that that is also probably really great to hear because how you have to be able to say to yourself, like, this is what I'm struggling with. It's okay that it looks different than someone else's writer's block, for example, or it looks different the last time I struggled with this. And I think that's got to be really powerful. Think about the kind of bravery it takes to say, I am experiencing this thing. It is related to my, in in the original case, grief. And to solve this problem, I'm going to walk away. And buy my contract back. I mean, we haven't talked about that. Nobody has talked to us about that. Um, But that does happen. You know, you can't finish. And so to get out from under it, you you pay the publisher back. (laughs) Yeah, right. Your advance, right. (laughs) And take the book away. And um, but what a also just brilliant person she is. I mean, just somebody who thinks clearly thinks so much about the writing. I was not at all surprised when Ellen Edwards said, go read Kinsale. Of course, we've all, many of us have experienced the the way the genre is sort of um, shamed, right? And the way that people allow themselves to sort of say like, oh, I like this. As I have, I have a friend who's a, a reader who mostly read fantasy and then sort of had a, like when she sort of finally said to me, I, I like romance too. It, it came in a very similar way, which was like, I always like those subplots in books, the love story part. So what would it be like to just allow myself to read that part, right? Or write that part. In Loretta's case to um, rewrite, Yes. Those stories and provide them with happily ever afters. Um, Yeah. What a cool. Also, what a cool way of coming to it and thinking like, I want to write a novel, but I know my brain requires limitations and scope and a strategy. And therefore, I'm going to turn to genre. Because it's going to give me that structure. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. We are releasing this episode much later in time than when we recorded it, but um, it made me think about what there was a sort of silly article that, you know, floated by in social media yesterday um, about a person who decided they were going to write romance because clearly that's where the money was, right? Um, Spoiler alert, there was no money for this particular person because they weren't very good at the job. But the, the, 
But what's fascinating is the difference between those two avenues, right? Like this was Loretta saying, I have creativity in me. I have the chops to write a novel, but I just need guidelines because if I don't, I'll never tell a story. And what a cool way of coming to romance. And then dominating it. I mean, also, what was wrong with readers in 1995? The Lord of Scoundrels was amazing. <laughs> that also was a year where there were not, I mean, I, now with the at rise of self-publishing, right? Literally thousands of books being released a year. More than that. Thousands a week, it feels like. A month, right? I mean, so I'm fascinated to think, too, like, what are the books that are coming out now that it's going to take everybody 10 or 12 years to discover? I mean, that's also like what I think of as being the best part about romance is, you know, things don't get me wrong. I think we all know that things can be dated, right? Or you can read an older book that feels dated in a way. But there is something magical about picking up a book from 25 years ago right in romance mm -hmm. and having it be just as sort of powerfully like moving as it was what the year it was published and i think that could be true of all of genre fiction you know people have heard me talk about jack reacher when i've been re-listening to jack reacher when i drive and the biggest change is about technology mm. right and so it's really fascinating to like sort of think like, well, what are the things that like date a book? And when it's historical, especially when it's a rooted in historical research, that doesn't get triggered the same way often. Mm. You're absolutely right. I loved a lot of this conversation. I love that she she clocked Jane and Krentz's powerful impact on historicals, which we talked a little bit about in the Jane and Krentz Trailblazer episode. Um, but hearing it from the mouth of Loretta Chase, right? Jane and Krentz became Amanda Quick and gave us all a blueprint for how to write these books differently. Um, you know, it just makes me smile. It makes me really happy that it was, it was all interconnected in such a powerful way. Um, those first Amanda Quicks were like late 80s, mm -hmm. right? 88 or 89, maybe. Yeah, sounds right. And Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women was 1992. Yeah. It, it was both the book, right? Both the books and the explicit naming of what romance was trying to achieve. Yes, and I was also really fascinated to hear her talk about that, like, kind of pop culture book. I can't remember the name of it now, but, like, talking, right? Like, the way people talk to each other. Like, I remember reading that book. I remember it wasn't quite, like, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like that old dumb thing. But it was just – and it was really fascinating, I think, also to think, too, just about – and we say this all the time. Like, romance is so responsive to what is going on in society – and it was really interesting to hear Loretta name some of those things really explicitly. She's remarkable. If you have not read a Loretta Chase book, now is your chance. Uh, you should read Lord of Scoundrels and then go back and listen to the deep dive episode that we did. We'll put links in show notes. Um, or go off and read uh, Mr. Impossible set in Egypt and then do yourself a favor. Give yourself a, a treat and watch Brendan Fraser's The Mummy. And know why romance Twitter. Sarah, can I can I um, confess something? Yeah, I, I've never seen that movie. <gasps> Jennifer, what what year? Wait, what year did it come out? Could someone? Nineteen ninety nine. Mm, okay. And I know you and I have a little thing coming, a little thing that actually might have already been announced. But if it has not already been announced, we have this little thing happening, and maybe a rewatch of the Mummy is a thing that we can do. A rewatch for you, a watch watch for me. A watch watch for you. Maybe we should have B and her books join us. <laughs> I'm I'm writing this down on my look, I have a little pad of paper, everybody, and it says bad ideas. Oh. And I write things down that are good ideas. Except, oh, it's ironic. It is. I don't let this <laughs> this note paper does not boss me around. <laughs> the mummy. That's a great idea. You will 
delight in it because it is part of our mutual favorite genre, beautiful people blowing things up. I mean, yeah, hello. I really <laughs> love, I love Brenda. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, we should be talking about Loretta Chase, but she wouldn't mind. Loretta would understand, I think. I mean, she wrote a whole book based on it, so yeah. I think she's okay. I love, God, I love those Brendan Fraser movies. I love the one um, where he's like trapped underground with his like fusty parents because they think nuclear war is coming. And I then know he, that one. It's, and then he pops out onto the surface like in modern times and he's, it is hilarious. It's that, so good. I mean, he was a treat. Yeah. And he's like a great yeah. swing dancer, but like, cause that's, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, and that was like when swing was really pie. popular. It was, oh my God, I can't remember the title. It's great. The way I wept when he won the Oscar this year and like gave a speech that was just about like being, still being here. Yeah. Like just yeah. still being here. Along with the guy from Everything Everywhere All at Once, who was also in Indiana Jones. Yeah, and Goonies. These are, look, our childhood. Um, yeah, I think I I loved listening to Loretta Chase. I especially really like, one of my favorite questions is, kind of what is the hallmark of your books? And I loved her answer. In particular, right, like the answer about, I never, I always assume my readers are smarter than me. Right. I always like I, I, I pledge to never write down to them. And I think re- romance readers know. I think we know when that's the case because we are so fine tuned. Right. Like so calibrated to hear that those discordant notes of when someone is like trying, as you said at the beginning, right, to right to market. I can make money here. These people I can make money off of versus these people have a similar interest in the same stories as me and I want to write books for them. Yeah. And it also, when she said that it, it made me realize that, I mean, and this is not just a hallmark of historicals, but it is a hallmark of historicals um, that often historical writer, that is a, that is something that happens in historicals where we sort of trust the reader to come along with us on this ride and we're going to show you the world and, you're going to know the history and you're going to know the, you know, what's happening. Um, and if you don't, it's going to be okay. Yeah. God, she just made me, she, every time I talk to Loretta, I just feel good about writing historicals. Yeah. I feel like it's nice to be sort of even remotely in the room, breathing the air of someone like her. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys are going to have a great time. Oh yeah. So come see us in, uh, Oh, gosh, we have to make sure this goes, this gets out before then. It's on my bad ideas list. Don't you worry. Oh, all right. Good. <laughs> so this will be out. It will probably be in the next couple of weeks, this event in in uh, Boston. And we hope that you'll join us. Thanks for having us, everybody. Thanks for having us in your ear holes. And thanks to Loretta Chase for just being, I, that was a really inspiring conversation. I loved it. God, for making me just want to put on a murder dress every day. Every day. What a gift. (laughs) All right. Goodbye, my friends.